Here's a data set we've looked at a couple of times already. The dots shows monthly average temperatures measured at a Met Office station in Cambridge from 1985 to the present. I'm also plotting a fitted model, in this case a sinusoid. Now, when you see a plot like this, your first instinct should be, I don't trust the model. This model is crying out for investigation. Would the model fit the data better if we allowed a long-term warming trend? Should the trend be linear, or maybe warming is accelerating? Is the difference between winter and summer stable, or are the extremes getting more extreme? Here's a famous quote about modelling. All models are wrong. The quote's by a statistician called George Box, who was described as one of the great statistical minds of the 20th century. All models are wrong, and you learn about the data set by trying out different models and seeing where they go wrong and improving them. You need to be able to turn your modelling ideas into maths and then into code in the blink of an eye. You have to spend your time thinking about what the model means, and you can't waste your time messing around with compilers or optimizers. So what we need is tools for modelling that are easy to use, fast to run, and which we can use to fit all sorts of different patterns in our data set. The tool is called linear modelling, and that's what we'll talk about in this video. Here's what a linear model is. A linear model is a type of supervised learning model. Supervised learning model, go back to the video for section 1.7 to remember that. It's a type of supervised learning model in which the response and the features are all numeric and where the response is predicted by a linear combination of features. That's all a bit of an abstract mouthful, so let's look at a concrete example. This example is a classic data set of measurements of irises. The data set was collected in the 1930s by a botanist called Edgar Anderson and popularised by Ronald Fisher, described as a genius who almost single-handedly created the foundations for modern statistical science. Ronald Fish was also the head of the Department of Eugenics at University College London, so there's that. We're standing on his shoulders as far as statistics is concerned, but I don't accept his other beliefs which are out of step even in his own time. Anyway, Fisher popularised this data set and he used it to showcase the statistical techniques he was developing. It's the same thing that's happening in modern machine learning. It's public data sets and its shared challenges that advances the field. This data set has 50 rows, each row with a measurement for a particular iris, and it lists several attributes, the petal dimensions, the sepal dimensions, and the species. Let's pick a completely arbitrary column for the response, let's say petal length, and let's ask, how does petal length depend on sepal length? Here's a plot. There's, there's clearly an overall increasing trend, which isn't very surprising. You'd expect bigger flowers to have bigger petals and bigger sepals. The plot doesn't make it look like it's linear, though. Let's guess it's a very simple nonlinear function, let's say quadratic. Let's guess that petal length is alpha plus beta times sepal length plus gamma times sepal length squared for some constants alpha, beta and gamma, which we'd like to estimate from the data. Now, at the start of this video, I said, we're going to look at linear models. You might be looking at this equation and thinking, that's not linear, that's a quadratic, that's most definitely nonlinear. I do indeed mean linear, and this equation is linear in the following sense. The defining characteristic of a linear model is that the response is predicted by a linear combination of features. I want to clarify that definition slightly. I want to say the response vector is predicted by a linear combination of feature vectors. What I mean by response vector is the vector of all of the responses, the entire petal length column from the data set, all n equals 50 of them in this particular data set. And the feature vectors here are sepal length, another entire column from the data set, and sepal length squared, which just means pointwise operation on each of the values in the sepal length column. 
And the linear combination that we're interested in is this. We're modeling the entire petal length vector PL1 up to PLN as being roughly alpha plus beta times the entire sepal length vector SL1 up to SLN plus gamma times another vector SL1 squared up to SLN squared. Now, for the sake of correctness, there really has to be another vector here next to the alpha, the vector consisting of all ones, because you can't add a scalar to a vector, or at least mathematicians can't, even if NumPy can. Now, you can probably figure out why I'm using all these funny colours here on this slide. I'm using orange for vectors. With pen and paper, you typically write them with an underline or with an arrow on top, but I'm using colour here. When I wrote out the quadratic equation at the top of the page, I meant it to be an equation about vectors. The thing to remember here is linear means vectors. When we write out a linear model, we're interested in vector equations, and the maths of vector equations is called linear algebra, and that's why these models are called linear models. So this is what a linear model is. The idea is that we write out a vector equation with parameters, and we want to estimate the parameters from the data. Here's how you do it in Python. Here's our vector equation again, and here's the code. First, I'll load in a CSV with all of the data, line one. Then line two, I get my vectors, the constant one vector, the sepal length vector, I'm calling it x here, and the petal length vector, let's call it y. I define a model object on line three. I tell it to fit the model on line four. The first argument is my three feature columns stacked together to make a matrix, and the second argument is the response vector y. Python goes away, estimates the parameters, and I get the estimates back by calling model.coef. Line three has this funny argument in it, fit intercept equals false. It's there because we nearly always want a one feature vector in our models, so this routine puts it in by default unless we explicitly tell it otherwise. So here's the idiomatic way to write this code. We don't bother creating the one feature vector and we create a linear regression object on line three. And because we didn't say otherwise, it assumed we do want one to be automatically added to our list of features. Then we call the model fit command and we don't need to include one. Then we can get out the parameters and to get out the parameter for the one feature vector we call model.intercept and to get out the other parameters, the parameters we explicitly told it about, we call model.coef. The next thing we generally want to do after we've estimated parameters is make predictions using our model. Here's how we can do that. First, I'll decide the feature values at which I want to get readouts. Here I'm telling it new x equals np.linspace 4.2, 8.220, which means give me 20 equally spaced values, which I'll be using for sepal length in the range 4.2 to 8.2. Then I can just evaluate my model formula, alpha plus beta times the new sepal length plus gamma times the new sepal length squared. In computer science, this is considered bad form because we have to go to the hassle of explicitly getting the coefficients out of the model and writing out the model formula, and bugs can slip in very easily when you do that sort of multiple steps. So there's a better way to make predictions. We'll set up new x, a vector containing all the sepal lengths, at which we'd like to predict, pe predict petal length, just as we did before. But now we use the command model.predict on the model object that we just fitted, and we give it the new matrix of features and it keeps track of the coefficients for us. It's still a bit of a bother that we have to write out the feature matrix once again, once on line four and again on line seven. And better languages for data science, like R, do this for us automatically, but in Python, this is the way to do it. Okay, let's summarize what we've learned about in this video. I've titled this slide, Least Squares Estimation, and we'll see in a moment what that is. So what we've seen is a linear model is a model of the form y approximately equal to beta 1 e1 plus dot 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 plus beta k e k, where y is the response vector and e1 up to e k are feature vectors. There's an approximately equals in there. What I mean by this is that we expect the y data to be noisy 
so we don't expect a perfect fit. Let's define epsilon to be the difference between the observed y and what we predict it to be, epsilon equals y minus the sum of the beta j times ej. This epsilon is called the residual vector. So far, all I've said about estimating the beta parameters is run this Python code. I should say exactly what it is that it does. Epsilon is the error. It's the difference between our model's predictions and the data of what the data actually was. So it's sensible to want to make the epsilon small. Formally, this is what the model fit code does. It tunes the beta parameters so as to make epsilon as small as possible in the sense of minimizing the mean square error, i.e. the mean value of all of the epsilon squared. I'm summing over all rows i in the data set, i equals 1 up to n, where n is the total number of rows. This procedure is known as least squares estimation. One thing I just want to stress once more. This is called a linear model because it's an equation about vectors. And equations about vectors fall under the heading of linear algebra, hence the name linear. And in my notation, I'm using orange for vectors. But before we finish, I just want to warn you about how people use this notation. Here's our linear model again. And as I've stressed repeatedly, it's an equation about vectors. All the vectors in this equation, the terms in orange, are column vectors referring to columns in our data set. I'll call this the, the data way of reading the equation. But there is another way to read this equation, what you might call the science way to read it. This is a scalar equation that I can use to make predictions. What I mean by this is, if I have a completely new iris and I only know its sepal length and I want to estimate its petal length, Okay, this is a bit contrived, but this sort of prediction makes much more sense for other data sets. If I want to estimate petal length for a single new flower, then all I need to do is plug in its sepal length, a scalar, on the right-hand side of the equation, and I'll get the prediction for this individual flower. So when we write out a linear model equation, the equation has this kind of dual personality. On one hand, it's a data equation with vectors describing the data that we have, and on the other hand, it's a science equation with scalars that we could use to make predictions for new cases. Hopefully it will be fairly intuitive how this works, but if you go into this with the computer science mentality of all my variables have to have a type, you'll get stuck. In this video, we've seen what a linear model is, and we've seen how to set it up, and how to use a computer to solve it, to fit it. In the next video, we'll look at how to invent features so that our linear model tells us useful things about the patterns hiding in our dataset.